So, the last session for the day is, of course, packed with great content, as we hoped it would be. And it's all about data. What would we do without it? And how do we actually prevent the misuse of it in terms of when, uh, when we're running our teams and when we're working within, the, uh, sorry, when we're working on the software that we run in the team? Oh, anyway. So actually, I don't recall the first time that I met the next speaker. She's actually one of those people who you've heard of, who you've seen the name of everywhere in some articles at work, behind a commit, in some um, other places, or on LinkedIn, all over the place. And so, of course, when we were thinking about data lens in culture, we're like, right, we knew who to go to. It's Jenny, and she has her work in the last few years has been very focused on just that, making sure that metrics and data and culture just intertwine in the best possible way. And so, please welcome Jenny Sang. Hi, uh, hi. my name is Jenny. I'm a data scientist and product lead at a Kiwi startup called Multitudes. Um, and I just really appreciate everyone being here. I know it's 3.30, it's like peak nap time. Um, so thanks for being here and I hope it's an interesting talk. Uh, I know we've heard a lot about engineering metrics today, Dora, all the rest of it. Um, so I'd like to expand on that a little by talking about how we actually use these metrics to uh, uncover insights about how our engineering teams are going in a way that's empowering and sustainable and crucially, not creepy. So um, I'll just uh, share a bit about like why I'm like why I'm qualified to talk about this. So the company I work for, Multitudes, started out because our CEO Lauren, who's um, second from the right, uh, she was running a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultancy, and they gave workshops to teams about um, you know the ones, and it's a really great opportunity to get everyone on the same page, to skill up so that everyone's on the same. Um, has the same language to work with when they're talking about how we might make a better team culture for everyone on teams. And so Lauren knew that workshops are just part of the solution when an organization is working on becoming more equitable and inclusive. So that fact really drove home when a company that they were thinking about working with uh, about some DEI things made national news because of a pretty big uh, workplace culture scandal. And I had to block out that thing in case there are legal ramifications of that, but um, yeah, I think everyone would have heard of it. It was a huge thing. Um, and this really drove home the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion can never be like a one and done thing. You need to have better feedback loops. It has to be embedded into the everyday culture. So after workshops, after, you know, like a one-off speaker comes in, that sort of thing, how do teams themselves know that they're actually improving in these metrics, in, in, these, in these sort of pillars? And so employee engagement surveys, they're really cool, they're interesting, they're very rich in qualitative information, but the accuracy depends on how many people actually choose to respond, and the data could be unreliable. Um, talking to people, of course, is the best, but it's not very scalable, and it's quite time intensive for people to um, have those kinds of in-depth conversations, and it also depends on how willing people are to share. So ultimately, we wanted to give people a way to have easy and regular feedback loops on how things are going. And so that means that individuals and teams can track, um, track their progress, have data for retros and one-on-ones that are sort of more informed and just have better conversations that lead to um, a culture that everyone can participate in fully. So that's how Multitudes was born. And so over the past few years, we've been speaking to literally hundreds of engineering managers, CTOs, uh, developers, uh, many of whom are in this crowd. So thank you if you've been part of that journey uh, to learn what the biggest challenges are that people face in engineering teams and then what's worked and why. And we think metrics can help with some of those challenges when used in the right way. So I'd like to distill those findings for you. First off, let's talk about why engineering culture is important in the first place. And like, I think after watch, reading and watching all the slides, I'm sort of uh, watching all the talks, I'm sort of like, wow, okay, this audience really knows why it's important, but you know, um, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so you might've heard the quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, it's a saying that no matter how great your business strategy is, it's gonna fail if you don't have a team culture to back it up and have people on board and pulling in the same direction. And so the same goes for, there's a parallel for engineering teams. So Lauren often says like code is easy, people are hard. Um, yeah, the biggest challenges that people often face are not technical hurdles, which while difficult, a strong team can work through them and find solutions. And Alan mentioned his, in his talk that uh, tech systems are inherently sort of social systems. 
Um, and so often the things that cause a team to fall apart are um, things like restructures that take a while to ramp up from, personalities that haven't um, learned to work together yet, a lack of alignment and priorities, all sort of people problems. Um, it's like this, this meme, which I think was a leak from like Zero's memes channel. You can like leave Zero, but the, <laughs> yeah, the memes don't leave you. Um, so we've all been in this situation before, and I'm like doing a bit of product now, so I kind of know the feels. Um, and we've been in this situation before because it is so easy for team culture to fall into these common traps with like engineering and product feeling at odds, uh, not being aligned on priorities, goals and stakeholders not being clearly communicated or understood clearly. So these are all people things and culture is what drives that for the better or for worse. So what makes up a strong team culture? Google's done a lot of research on this. They had a project called Project Aristotle. It studied hundreds of teams and found that psychological safety was by far the most important factor or the, most, the best predictor for a high performing team. And so this means uh, a, sheer, a sense of shared trust that team members are safe to take risks. So you can imagine things like a blameless culture when it comes to incidents or the sense that you won't be shunned if you bring up tough issues or throw a spanner in the works because you point out a problem in the plan or you know, proposing a new, a new idea. And also knowing that you can ask questions or ask for help without anyone thinking you're silly. So it's pretty easy to see why psychological safety would be really valuable for a team's success. The second thing that fosters strong team dynamics is shared experience. So there's lots of studies in org psych over many decades that show that teams that have worked together in the past perform better. So that's the case for software developers, developers security analysts, surgeons, astronauts, basketball teams. Um, there's probably been a case like a study for it. Um, but in the world of fast moving teams and fast moving projects, and especially in our industry where churn is quite a bit higher than other industries, shared team experience can be a rarity. Also, more recent research suggests that while team familiarity can be good for really routine things, it might be less effective for tasks that require new thinking and innovation. So for these reasons, restructures and team changes are probably unavoidable, but how do we manage that and manage the negative impacts when you have these uh, ruptures in shared experience? And the last thing is the environment. So there's been lots of studies that have found that environments with both diverse teams and where everyone feels included results in significantly higher business outcomes. Um, so 80% increase in the ability to innovate, like a 31% increase in responsiveness to changing customer needs. So, I mean, like, aside, aside from all the other reasons why diversity, equity, and inclusion are important, like even if you had like only capitalist reasons for it, like here they are. So um, while employee engagement and satisfaction surveys can give you visibility on this, as I mentioned earlier, they can get low response rates. Um, they're kind of hard to interpret, like it's hard, hard to pull out the key themes without your own sort of unconscious bias casting a lens over it. So yeah, these things are really important, but they can be hard to measure. So this is where engineering and metrics can come in. And so they provide a complement to things like conversations and one-on-ones and um, employee engagement surveys. And they collect data from a different source to those, a place where your team members are working, which is online. And so they've been getting a lot of airtime recently and not all good. Um, there's been some pretty big horror stories recently with CEOs sort of laying off developers based on lines of code written or tools that stack rank employees based on some like arbitrary metric and just quite general big brother-esque vibes that track and monitor behavior. And so, yeah, with, it's just, it's a bit of a wild west out there and it's kind of hard to know, you know, everyone's saying like, oh, you need Dora metrics, you need these metrics, but it's, you know, the ick is quite hard to work through. Um, having said that, metrics can provide real value in helping us improve what matters to us as long as we're thoughtful about what we choose to measure and how. So here are two examples. Um, Laura Taco is a VP of engineering and a leadership coach, and she here highlights the benefits of measuring what you want to improve, and then also, but also the risks and how you should roll it out. And then Rebecca here was an engineering manager at Stripe. Yeah, and then when she was rolling out developer metrics, she found it valuable in how it informed team conversations. So we can see that engineering metrics, like Dora and like some other ones I'll touch on, can bring value. Um, it can give you better visibility over team health, especially in a world where remote working is now the norm. I, met I mentioned in the intro that it can help with providing fast feedback loops on not just team performance and st system stability, but also aspects of team culture. Um, a case that I saw uh, at Multitudes actually um, that really inspires me and I think back to a lot is that 
there was a team where a manager thought one person was doing a lot less work than others, but uh, the team had access to not just performance data, but also data on collaboration. And so they saw specifically feedback and they saw that this person was actually getting less feedback than everyone else by quite a significant margin, um, which is a pretty key ingredient for growth and learning. And I mean, in the case of software, like you need reviews, like you need co-reviews to ship things. So um, coincidentally, the, that person also happened to be the only woman in the team. And there's lots of research out there that shows that women receive less feedback and the feedback they do receive is less specific and actionable. So that team was able to use the data insight to work on distributing feedback more evenly across the team. And so, yeah, you can definitely see that there are ways metrics can be used to identify issues early, measure progress, uh, inform decisions, um, and bring that in along with the human context to make decisions. It can help you see past blank spots and unconscious biases and reveal insights that you might not have picked up on your own with just your own lens on how, team, how the team's going. Now, the question of what to measure is really important, but fortunately, a lot of that thinking has already been done for us in our industry. There are two main complementary frameworks that are widely accepted as industry standards, and they're the result of years of org psych. Um, so it can really help you sort of skip over all the pitfalls that you could fall down. Um, like measuring reductive metrics like lines of code or numbers of pull requests per person, and it can help you, you know, avoid those sort of backfirings. So the first one is DORA, uh, it stands for DevOps Research and Metrics uh, and Assessment. It's the result of years of research across thousands of teams um, for a reliable and actionable set of metrics to understand software team performance. Um, it's from the book Accelerate, which was mentioned earlier. So you've got two velocity metrics and two stability metrics. Um, I won't go over them because I think um, it's been talked about a lot and you can look it up, but um, the, I think the key to understand is that they're really good at covering a broad base of system stability and like software team sort of performance. Um, and how you measure these is dependent on your stack. There's lots of tools out there to help you get you started. You can build your own dashboard. You can try an open source or open source thing. You can pay for a tool. There are lots of options. Um, but yeah, these have kind of become a standard because now every year, they put out this like state of DevOps report, and that means you can help, you can benchmark your teams against your industry, even your subsection of the industry, you know, similar organization size, and it also shows trends in how the industry is evolving in their practices. So the, auth the authors of Dora then moved on to expand it in 2021 to capture more of the human elements of engineering performance because they recognized that engineering pro productivity is about so much more than just activity and incidents and pull requests and deploys. So it expands on Dora to include well-being, collaboration, satisfaction, that sort of thing. So you've got satisfaction and well-being, so that's you know, burnout, efficacy, does everyone have the tools that they need? Performance, so quality, including change failure rate, time to restore, but also things like, are we moving the needle on customer satisfaction? So activities, all the deployment frequency incidents, the severity of the incidents. Communication and collaboration is the one that I am really um, interested in. So it's things like, who's working with who? Are there like, knowledge silos around? How long does it take to onboard someone? Um, who's doing a lot of the support work, the documentation, the reviews? And um, yeah, as, as Alicia mentioned in her talk, like, it's not just about who needs support, it's about getting visibility on whether you've got a culture that allows everyone to give feedback to anyone. It's not just juniors getting support from seniors, it's juniors being able to have the freedom to ask questions and to um, question like infrastructure decisions or yes, um, architecture decisions that other people have made. And so I think that's a really important part of space and, a, and an area where it really expands on Dora in a cool way. And the last one is efficiency and flow. So that's you know lead time, that sort of thing, but also how much focus time are people getting? How often are people getting interrupted? How long do people wait for reviews? So to give an example of why incorporating well-being and collaboration is important, so this is just a made up example. So let's say Team Yetis is shipping code faster, which is a performance or activity metric from Dora, but they're also doing more out of hours work. So their well-being metric is, is going badly. And so this makes sure that people aren't getting high performance at the expense of well-being, which would never be sustainable anyway. It's often an early indicator of burnout and churn. And so um, this is why space is a really great way to measure not just the performance, but everything else that leads to long-term sustainable performance. So um, that's cool, but how do you use these metrics day to day? And how do you do it in a way that will empower teams? So um, here there are four sort of rules of thumb that I'd like to propose today. The first is to remember that the data is never the full picture. So you could look at these developer metrics to prepare for a retro or a one-on-one -on -one or a stand-up. Um, it's cool, it's 
a good idea to use them as a conversation starter and not hard evidence of something going like absolutely wrong or absolutely right. And so we recommend presenting the data in a way that promotes discussion. So you could ask something like, hey, it looks like deployment frequency has been dropping over the last two cycles. Um, does that line up with how things are feeling on the ground in the team? Are there any ideas on what could be contributing? And so that gives the team opportunity to bring their own context and to share maybe they're working on some tech debt or there's a big gnarly refactor going on. Um, or maybe the data is being measured wrong and you need to change that. But the team should have an opportunity to weigh in on that. And so, yeah, much like uh, what people have been saying about security as well, the team has the most context and it would be a real shame to not use that when you're interpreting this information. I and mean, it's just a good practice for interpreting data in general is bringing the real world context into those numbers and not using numbers as like the be all and end all. Secondly, uh, openness. So it's really important to let your team know that you're trying out engineering metrics and get buy-in from them first. Um, there are some real horror stories that I've come across where people wrote out the metrics framework without buy-in and that really damaged the trust and the team's sort of cohesion. So giving your team members opportunities opportunities to weigh in on how metrics are being used um, and then also a few weeks later maybe in a retro checking in on how it's going and whether it's useful and how they can change um, how it's being used if there are any if there's any feedback on on what's what's good what's not and then coming up with a solution together so in the same way that people teams should be maintaining sort of values product ideas infrastructure team norms that should be created and maintained together as a team the same should go for the metrics that the team is holding themselves by so on that note, uh, being transparent about the data being collected is really important as well. And so we really recommend giving teams access to their own data if possible. Um, that creates a high trust environment and it also lets the team members view and use their own data to set their own goals and keep themselves accountable. And so um, that's, I think, in my view, like a, an example of a really empowered team is when an individual, for example, in a one-on-one -on -one can use their own data to set their own goals and then to work towards them and keep track and then advocate for that in the next performance review and say, hey, I like set this goal. This was what I want to get to, and I got to it. So um, we, we really recommend that transparency of sharing data and giving people access to their own data. And the last one is we really recommend, and certainly don't rank, um, don't, we, we, we recommend that you don't track and you certainly don't rank by individual performance metrics. So that's things like lines of code, numbers of pull requests, how fast people are merging their PRs, shown at an individual level. Um, yeah, this might seem intuitive, but it's, it's a whole thing at the moment. Um, firstly, it's just not useful. Software is a team sport. And if someone's taking ages to merge a PR, that's probably not their fault. Like they need other people to be reviewing their code. It might be really complex. Maybe they're stuck with all the glue work um, to help other people in the team move faster. And so it's not really about the individual at all. And um, it's just, a, it, doesn't, it doesn't give any bearing on that individual's contribution to the team. Secondly, uh, knowing that people's performance is being measured using simplistic measures like these means that people are incentivized to game them. And rather than focusing on the team's goal, that's just the last thing you want to do with your engineers to be working on. Um, there was, I think recently, there was like a pretty well-known company that tried to roll out some individual performance metrics and have it feed into performance reviews. And then developers just ended up writing scripts to like game their commits. And then that's just... <laughs> It's just the last thing you want people spending time on. And then you can imagine what that did to the culture and the trust in the team. It was just like, yeah, no. Um, so yeah, it's just, just don't go there, basically. It's just pointless and it'll be terrible. Cool, so uh, on that note, to summarize, um, metrics are a really great way to make sure that the important things aren't being missed in the conversations you're already having. So we know that getting culture is right, getting culture right can be challenging, um, but it is crucial to any team's success. When it's done right, metrics can help you measure um, progress towards a more equitable culture as a valuable data point alongside other data like qualitative feedback or observing your teams in person. There are lots of frameworks already out there to get you started like Dora and Space, and they can help you avoid some of the pitfalls of metrics like making sure you're measuring the right thing, making sure you have visibility over well-being and collaboration as well as, well as performance, and then how you measure those things in a way that helps you um, yeah, move with the rest of the industry if you're, if you're interested in that. And when you implement these frameworks and use them day to day, we really recommend keeping the human context in the picture by using these data insights as conversation starters. So people should ideally have access to their own data or at least transparency of what metrics are being measured and how they're being used and they should have opportunities to give feedback on how it's going. 
And then finally, it's important to remember that the mythical 10x developer is not a thing anymore. It's very 2010. Um, it's counterproductive to focus on individual performance. Software is a team sport, so the focus should always be on the team level. So um, that's the talk. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Um, some things that you can check out if you're interested. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Well, we actually do have uh, some time for the horrifying Q&A, if you're okay with that. <laughs> Please be nice, it's the end of the day. Any questions for Jenny? Uh, are there any tools that you know of that can easily hook into a repo and give these metrics? Oh, sorry. Are there any tools that, what was the last part of the question? Uh, hook into repos to give metrics. As hook into well. repos to do metrics? Oh, um, multitudes? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there, are, there are lots. Like, there are heaps out there. Um, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to make this not salesy. Uh, it's, we really care about well-being, collaboration, as well as performance. Um, but, there, yeah, there are lots out there if you Google, like, you know, Dora metrics or engineering metrics tool, yeah. Uh, I'm just adding to that. I think Multitudes and Jenny does put out a lot of blog posts and content around this sort of improvements as well. So even if you don't have the budget to take on the thing, their content's still excellent and their meetups are still quite good as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we've struggled with is time to recover. Mm -hmm. Because an incident is a complex thing from when a customer first experiences it through to when a team first realises it to when a team realises it's actually their fault through to when a team deigns to respond to it. And sometimes you have incidents that aren't really incidents and they drag on for three or four days because nobody has priority. How do you deal with that sort of noisiness in the data around recovery? Yeah. So um, just to make sure I'm, I've got the right question. Are you asking why, um, how do you get clean data on cases like incidents where the start can be really tricky, attributing it to a team can be really tricky, all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, mean time to restore one of the four Dora metrics is quite tricky to measure and it does rely on sort of the team agreeing on a set of um, norms around how you deal with incidents. So once an incident is open, we're gonna like, you know, flag it in Ops Genie, have this go to the Slack channel. I mean, you can do it really lightweight. You could just do it in a Slack channel and say like, hey, P1 happening here check this link on this CloudWatch log. Um, but whatever you define it as, um, that is how, yeah, it, it really depends on the team. So if you want to do a really light touch thing, you can do that and then just chuck it into a spreadsheet. If you want to use, you know, a proprietary tool, you can have it link up to whatever, see, I, I mean, IMS tool you've got and then say like incident start is when you should start measuring, incident close is when you should measure, we should stop measuring and then, and then the tool would, would normally calculate that for you. Um, but yeah, in terms of how, complex you want to make it, it depends on the team and, and the kind of processes you're after. But I saw you, the person in the back on that corner. Hi, thank you. How do you measure teams' well-being and define it without constant surveys that drag down their well-being? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's... it's Oh, the question. So the question is, um, how do you measure well-being in a, in a good way without constant surveys that drag down the team and drag things out? So, um, yeah, the way that we measure well-being is we measure out-of-hours commits, and so people can set the hours that you expect people to be working, and then if it's outside of those hours, then it's counted. Um, so it can be sort of like, oh, so-and-so did like a bunch of out-of-hours commits on a Sunday, and then that could feed into a one-on-one -on -one where you're like, oh, did you want some time in lieu, or is there something we can change to make sure that you're not crunched like that in the future? That's like one way to do it. Um, obviously, well-being is so broad, and so things around surveys, I mean, we've sort of been experimenting with very light touch ways to do surveys, but you can, you know, push them out to Slack and make it a one question thing where it's just like a pulse check. Or um, I think these are things that teams do already, like those team health checks and, you know, red, yellow, green uh, traffic lights. But um, yeah, we're sort of interested in how do you collect that data and present it in a way that's actionable. Yeah. And that would be the last question before we transition.
Uh, thank you so much for raising awareness of this um, topic, of the topic of um, looking at the picture holistically and uh, the you know, engineering experience. Uh, my question was around one of the first topics that you touched on, which is understanding the context. Mm. So uh, what we've done in the past is we've gotten all these metrics, which is really interesting, but it's hard to understand what is the cause behind them. Like if you've got low satisfaction scores, do you have any insights as to how you can get a better understanding of the reasons behind the metrics? Yeah, so the question was, um, how do you get better context behind the metrics? So you've got all these numbers, but how do you know what's causing them and how you can change them? Um, I think this is where coaching comes in. And um, yeah, so this is, this is where that, that sort of where engineering managers come in and your experience and, um, and the work you do with talking to your team members and having those retros and things like that. So I don't think metrics should ever replace that. And so, um, yeah, the reasons and the causes behind it will be, um, will be different for each team. They tend to be sort of similar. I mean, there's a lot of research that's already been done about what impacts developer satisfaction. It's often things like lack of autonomy, um, lack of like not being able to work on something that allows you to grow, or, like lack of growth opportunities, work-life balance. Um, there are like set buckets that they tend to fall into. But yeah, even then, you definitely want to be having conversations with people to figure out exactly what it is and what solution would work for that person and that team. So yeah, it's, um, it's the same stuff, but just we think like better informed by data. Hey, and that is the last of the questions for Jenny. Thank you so much. Please give her a round of applause.